Hello and welcome to One and One. I am Cyril Stover. My guest today is a ranking senator, a lawyer, a technologist, a technocrat, and a farmer. Now his foray into politics began on being elected a member of the Constituent Assembly in 1977. Now that's the body that drafted the 1979 Constitution. He was a pioneer member of the defunct National Party of Nigeria, NPM, where he was chairman of the Old Plant State Branch. Now, after the termination of the Second Republic, he was appointed Minister of State, Works and Housing under the General Sanya Return of Politics in 1997, he joined the former United Nigeria Congress Party, UNCP, but that was short-lived. 1998 was the turning point when he became a founding member of the People's Democratic elected senator representing Nasara West Senatorial District. Let's welcome Senator Abdullahi Adam Sarkinya in Kefi. Thank you, sir. Well, it's good to have you join us. Pleasure to be with you. Yes, you started off a um, long time ago and uh, from the NPM, what was known as the NPM then, before the uh, Second Republic was terminated by the military, and the subsequent attempts at democracy. But like you said, you became governor on the platform of the PDP. Now that party still exists today, but you have since moved on and become a member of the APC, the All Progressives Congress. Now Nigerians say, well, that's the way with politicians. Um, was it about ideology, or was it just you needed a platform to be able to go back in a position of political power? Thank you so much. I think talking about the ideology. Uh, what one sees in Nigerian politics is that there's not so much of ideological view. Anybody talking about ideology is really not talking in the real sense of that expression and that kind of practice in any democracy organization. What we do here, we often find people of like mind, people who agree at a point in time to work together based on some rules of engagement, uh, which they call their constitution. And uh, along the line, sometimes, you know, the center doesn't hold, and uh, you have reason to, 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 to take a look at what is around and see if what you believe what it should be, if what you believe service of people should be, is on another platform. But you don't hesitate, you, you move on. And what happened with that? And this happened way back in 2013. Right. Um, there were a lot of uh, misgivings in the PDP. I was at the time, I have been served, in fact, served then already as, as a, 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 a Secretary of the Board of Trustees after my governorship, like you rightly uh, asked me for the intro. And uh, I was already elected in the platform of the PDP uh, when so many things started going wrong. And those who were in a position to listen to people who had reason to complain over anything, you know, weren't quite either in the spirit or they just didn't consider the complaints as serious enough for their attention and therefore didn't give the complaints the observations that would make for the better run a smoother position of the party and enhance its uh, fortune. But they didn't listen. At the point in time, I said, well, that's just it. We just have to move on. And it happened. While this was happening, there was an amal amalgamation of uh, three, four parties at the time that were just on the verge of registration. And uh, with your representation, there were about uh, seven of us, either for my governors or seven governors at the time. I thought, personally, that if we met uh, President Jonathan, as he then was a couple of times, I met him personally a couple of times, uh, we discussed issues. But it's end why you start the discussion. Nothing happens. And um, uh, it came on the heat when we went to the convention. The list from states for the convention was different from the list that was submitted at the gate. So people went for the convention and they were thoroughly, thoroughly embarrassed. The thing about policy anywhere in the world, but in the local, by the time people come out of the convention, but you find that any policy is Yeah. 
spot there in the national uh, square. We went, we met the president, the sitter. Sit here with the NT, I'm sure you have it. We met the president. This was the company of excellency. The whole talk to the party chairman. The party chairman, we don't even say anything. The, 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 the chairman of trustees, we don't say anything either. So in that point, we didn't give any gossiper the opportunity to go and say, A was happening or B was not happening with uh, Mr. Uh, a or uh, party member B was doing anything in the party. We went broad daylight before the entire citizen of the federal government. Hate speech is not a joke. It incites genocide and crimes against humanity. Most of Africa's civil wars are caused by hate speech from one tribe against another. We don't want it here. The Nigerian government stands firm against hate speech. I was distressed to notice that some of the comments, especially in the social media, have crossed our national red lines by daring to question our collective existence as a nation. This is a step too far. One nation bound in freedom. In fact, started then already as, as a, 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 a secretary of the Board of Trustees after my governorship, like you rightly uh, observed in the intro. And uh, I was already elected on the platform of the PDP. And when so many things started going wrong, and those who were in a position to listen to people who had reason to complain over anything, you know, weren't quite, either they weren't in the spirit or they just didn't consider the complaints as serious enough for their attention and therefore didn't give the complaints, the observations that would make for the better run and smooth administration of the party and enhance its uh, fortune. Because they didn't listen. At the point in time, we said, well, that's just it. We just have to move on. And it happened. While this was happening, there was an amal amalgamation of uh, three, four parties at the time, you know, that were just on the verge of a registration. And uh, we did a representation. There were about uh, seven of us, either former governors or serving governors at the time in 2013, that thought there's a need you know, to move if the party wouldn't listen. We met. Uh, President Jonathan, as he then was, uh, a couple of times. I met him personally a number of times. Uh, we discuss issues, but it's end where you stop the discussion. Nothing happens after that. And um, uh, it came of a heat when we went to the convention. The list from states for the convention were different from the list that was submitted at the gate. So people went for the convention and they were thoroughly, thoroughly embarrassed. The thing about politics, anywhere in the world, politics is local. By the time people come out to Abuja for a convention, only to find that their names are not on the, on the list, and they turn to their leaders, they came from their part of Nigeria, and they find that you don't have any, we don't have an explanation for it. And when you, on the spot there in the National uh, Eagle Square, we went, we met the president. The steps are still here with the NT, I'm sure you have it. We met the president. This is what is happening, Your Excellency. Or talk to the party chairman. The party chairman was not able to say anything. The, the, the chairman board of trustees wasn't saying anything either. So at that point, we didn't give any gossiper an opportunity to go and say A was happening or B was not happening with uh, Mr. A or uh, uh, party member B was doing anything against the party. We went broad daylight before the entire citizen of the federal government who are watching the program live and walked to the stadium. We walked out of uh, Eagle Square and went to address the press, uh, world press conference. That's why he started. Mm -hmm. Then there were, there, were, there were interventions by well-meaning people at the time who felt something you know, should be done to, to arrest that situation. Uh, former President Ibrahim Wangida was a member of a committee. Obasanjo was there. Uh, the former president also, um, Tony Anini, was the chairman of the Board of Trustees at the time. He was on the committee. Uh, well, uh, uh, Kanamada Ali, who was chairman of PDP at, at some point in time, was also a member of the committee, constituted by the president himself. But when they turned out their report, they didn't accept that report. <laughs> <laughs> the party and the president then didn't accept the report. And in, that, in that kind of situation, you know, you just can't just hang on for hanging on sake. All right. So that would seem to be a problem with internal democracy in the party structure, Senator. 
But then political watchers say it's common to virtually all the political parties in Nigeria. That's, uh, it's, uh, that is the, the standard, unfortunately, in the political space, that there is no internal democracy with the parties. Is that also true of the APC? I, I, I think there is, you see, if I say to you that there's any particular party in Nigeria that doesn't have problem with internal democracy, I'll be lying. I won't say so. But it's a game of relativity. Some parties are more in tune with the lack of internal democracy than others. That's the much I can say on that. All right. So it would seem that uh, the APC today I believe, is... I believe what I'm better said. I believe very strongly that uh, the APC is better organized. I believe that, uh, yes, like another party, we have our own problems uh, as a party. Because once you have any human organization that you, you, you want to give yourself the impression that there have been no problem, you'll, be, you'll, not, you'll not be sincere with yourself, let alone with the public. There are problems in the party. But the thing is, some, pro some problems and some parties have, are not just, have not just the capacity to s take a look at their pro pro problem and resolve them. Or if they uh, attempt to do, they do so with some passing. And uh, there's one day going gets to go as a bad way of uh, <laughs> People say, the people say these are the issues that greatly affect the quality of leadership we have. Now, you started off being a students' union leader. I remember reading that you... Student union government. Yeah. Yes, yes. You, you were once uh, president of the National Association of Nigerian Students. Yes. No, so... A comrade like you were. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. Now, at that level... You became aware of what was happening, and yes. then you went on to go into may, may, you went on into mainstream politics. But people always question the process of leadership recruitment in Nigeria and say that is the basic problem. What do you think? I will agree with you to a very very large extent. You see, one, we hardly set criteria for officers when people come seeking mandate for those offices. Um, because most of these parties, you know, they start, like I said in the beginning, with some people of common interests and like minds and setting up, you know, uh, a platform. They mobilize people of their type. And when they get registration, the struggle starts from there. And the struggle gets more intense when elections for officers come on. And we do not seem to care much, and that's a very big problem for our democracy. We don't seem to care much. Who do you trust with what responsibility? What criteria are you having? for ensuring that the person that you are trying to entrust with this office is squarely, as far as human judgment will go, qualified for that kind of responsibility. We don't do this homework. Often, uh, it is all oh, a particular tribe or a particular group or a particular interest group in, in a community or in a state is not, is not fully represented. They want to be represented. And, they can make some noise, and when that noise is hard, and you know, depending on the time and the circumstances, they are listened to, and then you throw up a person. And you find a person comes to take responsibility for which he is not even prepared for. He doesn't even have an appreciation of the, the depth of responsibility thrust on that office that he now wants to, 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 to occupy. And uh, I say democracy, I guess, he gets elected. So you can do, and once you get elected and you are in the, in the, that's a state assembly or national assembly, the legislature is a leveler. Once you have a mandate from your people, no matter who you are, you have the same authority, you have the same responsibility, you have the same rights. As in, and uh, there's one day going gets to go, as a bad way of uh, <laughs> public memory would say, that you begin to sort the grain from the shaft. So now that we have this question about the leadership and that, that has reflected in the various administrations that we have. And so Nigeria today faces numerous challenges along the lines, uh, successive governments have tried to address them. Today, 
we have the APC as the governing party, and uh, it's looking at so many things, from the economy to questions of food security. And I'd like to, to dwell a little longer on food security, because uh, we've described you as a farmer. And of course, you, the National Agricultural Foundation of Nigeria, were chairman of, 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 of that as well. Yeah. And uh, at some point, the All Farmers Association of Nigeria. Yeah. So you have been someone who's been in it. What is the biggest challenge we face today in terms of food security? I, I think the biggest challenge we face is one, to have all along a reasonable understanding of what government is all about. Over time, we have not been able to address what you see or what I see as key issues that are fundamental to success of government and government serving the interests of the people. I say this because I do know from my very elementary stages of life and politics <clears throat> that Government is about securing, protecting, you know, the interests, the life of the individual citizen. And by extension also protecting his property. Right? So it starts with life. Life. For life to have meaning, you must nourish it. You must feed it. And to do so requires food. If you have a population, you hardly can on authority say how many people you have in Nigeria at a particular point in time for you to be able to design, to plan how do I feed these mouths? Sounds elementary, but that's the key. Because a hungry man or woman, an angry person, I mean, a hungry person is an, is an angry person. If you can't feed your people, what you call sovereignty is not there with you. If you can't produce what your people will eat and drink, you, you only be cheating yourself by saying that you are a sovereign state, you are a sovereign country, an independent country. You are not. So, all along, we've not been we've not been on the train to achieving those objectives until just you know the advent of this administration under President Muhammadu Buhari took a look at it, a hard look at it, and said, look. We are faced with the problem of unemployment. We are probably faced with the problem of food security. Along with that, how do we solve it? We've had oil. We've got monies have rolled into this country. You need to get the statistics of production of oil and gas and how much we sold over the last, just take the last 30 years to date, how much money we made out of it. What do we do with the money? up to the point in time, when we're still hungry, when we still have problems of the protection of the life we're talking about and the property, what, has, what do we need to do? This administration has come and said, look, yes, well and good, we are, we are lucky, we have oil, we have gas, but we need more than that to have a stable economy. We need more than that. To, to, to be able to, to take very fundamental responsibilities in our hands and aim at achieving them. Mm -hmm. So we came with this idea of going back, whatever you call it, of land, bringing food production, agriculture to the front banner. But unless and until we can feed ourselves, unless and until we can produce enough to feed ourselves, we cannot talk of being independent or successful. So over time, the problem has been money to the poor farmer. How does he access funds? The problem has been even land administration. Most of the smallholder farmers we have, the land they are on is not their land. They are probably, they're just patching on the land. In fact, to some extent, you can call it some, some residue of, uh, of, uh, of uh, um, um, 
the, the, the old feudal system, if you permit, mm -hmm. all right? And uh, until you can resolve these issues, until people will get to understand how to enhance production itself, where they're able to, you know, uh, have some piece of land, how they, if they're able to have some little money, how do they handle every aspect of production of any particular commodity you're talking about for the country? This requires education. This requires extension workers. How much do we have at the moment for extension workers? How much are they doing? What are their problems? These are issues that confront food production and uh, food security. Right. While this administration might have taken the bull by the horn to no. solve these, there are still issues of that consistency of policy. I'll give you an example. People have said, yes, now that Nigerians are growing more rice, we should do completely away with imported rice. At some point in time, they say, ban the importation. At some time, point in time, they say, no, allow it to come in, but put on high tariffs. Now, these are the things that people look at and say, there so, is so, no... Sir, so, so, so you are absolutely right on this. We got it. There has been policy somersault over time. We've said it time and again. You know, we've not been consistent. If we have a, pro uh, a policy on the ground, have some little problem, or we have change of administration, or whatever, if you just throw it over. And that has harmed our efforts in no small way. Each time you import any commodity to this country, I've said it time and again, by that action, you are empowering the farmer from the country that is exporting to us. You are making it possible for them to solve some of their unemployment problems. You are helping them to take care of even basic things like um, uh, microeconomics of their countries. While you do this, you are compounding your problem on all of those factors. It's bad. And uh, unless we get a bit consistent with our thinking, with our planning, with our implementation of pro policies and programs, we will continue to be in this touch, unfortunately. I'm happy that uh, we have seen what the uh, uh, RISE program we're talking about has, has, has done over the just over two, three years. Okay? And uh, you have this uh, uh, a program that uh, was anchored by you know, um, uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria through some select banks, you know, the ANCO in a borrow a program uh, where a farmer, a major farmer is identified for a particular commodity and uh, there are chains of farmers, hundreds, thousands of them. And then there's some facilities made available, finance fund, funding is made available and every farmer in that cooperative or whatever name they give, they, they have, you know, you know, queues into it, gets this money and they work. They get fertilizer through that, they get pesticide through that, they get you know, preservatives through that. And within just two, three years, we've seen what you can do. And we're saying, yes, well done. We can detour. We can replicate this effort to some other commodities. We cannot just go one whole swoop and do everything at a go. But at least this one has worked. We can add two or three commodities and then have a timeline within which, by the end of that, we are able to talk about the fact that we are more self-sufficient than the story that uh, at this point in time. Right. We started with agriculture and food security because, as you mentioned, an angry man, a hungry man yeah. is an angry yeah. man. Yes. And uh, there's no knowing where the angry man, what he might resort to. Exactly. And we have crime, we have all kinds of things. And today, one of the biggest issues in the land is that of uh, insecurity as well to lands and property. Yeah. And... Uh, Yes, as you mentioned, where you have millions who are unemployed and uh, they can't go back to the land, there has to be some outlet. And we've seen that in the rate of crime, insecurity to life. And Sometimes you think that these issues are a bit too much for this government to handle. Well, that's very true. Uh, we are dealing with problems that have accumulated over time and uh, they've not been given sufficient attention or there hasn't been consistency in that in the, in the attention that these problems were given and therefore where, where we are today. Um, the 
problem of unemployment, no country known to me has a zero unemployment, you know, status. None. America was all the story we talk about America, America economy. They have got unemployed people. You go to the United Kingdom, they have got unemployed people. Go to Germany, all the so-called developed countries, they have got unemployment. They have to battle with that problem by the day. So I am not justifying by that, you know, analogy, you know, that uh, yes, we should, be, we, should, we should settle down, we have unemployment, so what? No, this is the problem. But what is more worrying is what do you do to curb unemployment? What do you do in the Nigerian situation, the Nigerian environment, to curb unemployment to the barest minimum that our resources can, you know, bring the, 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 the problem. One, as I was growing in this Nigeria, I knew there was a time when the government, I give you an example of what I know, government of northern Nigeria, defend northern Nigeria. You go to Kaduna, there was an office. There was an office that had statistics, reliable statistics, as to how many institutions we had, how many of them had, had what, the, what number of students, how many of the students were graduating at a particular time. Okay? There were statistics as to possible areas of employment, possible areas of employment in government and in the private sector. Statistics were available. And believe you me, I was a beneficiary of that system. Mm. By the time you are graduating, you have two, three institutions. You know, I, I mean, uh, 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 um, potential employers coming to recruit, coming to have an interview. I agree that numerically, people seeking employment have, have, have increased, and there are millions. But if we had sustained the, 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 the approach that those governments had at that time and improved on, would not be where we are today. Now, people are chasing jobs that don't exist, unfortunately. And so, one of the reasons why agriculture is also readily there is the fact that agriculture is the highest employer or has the highest uh, 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 capacity to employ people who are in need of able-bodied young men and women. Agriculture has the greatest potential for employment. And with this effort of bringing agriculture to the front banner, it is hoped, it is hoped that if we take a look at it and we, 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 we evolve policies that will make for its growth and for the a maximization of the benefits that could accrue from that growth, who would be better off with the issue of unemployment in this country? Of course, there are other, there are other areas in the, in the in particularly in the private sector, uh, for, for, for employment of the, of the the young men and women that we have. It is a big problem. It's a very big problem, and uh, unless we address it, we have problems. It's like a time bomb. But having said that, there is also that a, a problem that has nothing to do with unemployment that you can associate with the youth. And as long as that problem is not resolved, even the efforts we are making to get young men and women employed will suffer. I don't know if you notice the extent to which our children are becoming drug addicts. It is a very, very serious problem that we have now. Just take a drive anywhere. Stop at any motor park or any terminal. As you stop, see how many young men are get on you. They will be saying, oh, man, if you're a politician, it's even worse. If you are a broadcaster and you go out there with some nice looking car, <laughs> <laughs> it's bad enough for you. And what are they looking for? They're looking for tropics, right? 
if they are talking to you, don't sit there. You will see that they are looking more the direction of your hand. If you dare put your hand in your pocket, they see you take, before you get out of your pocket, you see hundreds of hands into your car. If you give one of them, if you are not careful, that guy will not be safe for that day. Because it will go pounce on him. And it goes on like that. Now, some of these young people are not employable, unfortunately. Because you can't employ a person who cannot be sure of his state of mind for most times of the day. Okay? So that is another, that's another dimension to it. But essentially, I do appreciate, I do agree, we have problem of unemployed, and we must try to see what we can do to get them on board. But that is one problem that is lacking, and it's doing a lot of harm to our, to our young people. You know. Right. But the educational uh, institutions, the educational institutions are daily churning out more and more young people. And uh, the question is, right from the time they go into study, do they expect to be employable at the end of it or to be employers of labor? Let's use you as an example. Your first field of study was um, building and civil engineering. Yeah. Well, um, it's a long way away from that now, yes. but you practiced at some point in time. Today, one of the issues still bedeviling the country has to do with the uh, infrastructure deficit. We have people who are qualified, but who cannot do the jobs that the papers they hold say they can do. Is it the system? That is a sad commentary, really sad. And um, we all should be ashamed of that situation. As we are. Here we are talking of unemployment. Uh, while in the Senate, I think during my first tenure in the Senate, uh, we had a public hearing. I used to do with this issue of unemployment. I was ashamed to see the passion with which employers, employers were complaining of the institutions turning out young men and women that are not employable. I have a friend, I give you just a small example, who has a steward. I want to go that long. What's a steward? The steward has a diploma in catering. A diploma in catering. I said, I told this friend, I saw the boy. I found a way to get him to show me his papers. That boy cannot write something like a small two, three, four lines to his parents. Couldn't do it. He offended his employer, write one or two lines, apologize him, couldn't do it. And the most basic thing you expect somebody who has done diploma in catering to do, he couldn't do. So steward, he wanted him to be a cook when he couldn't be a steward. That's just one example. When I was privileged to be a governor, I had a situation in which I saw something different from what was the case when I was going in the system myself. A situation in which a person writes you a memo, a memo, do an appraisal of a project or whatever, and you go correcting the memo times without number. I had a situation when I'm writing a letter as governor of a state to the president over any issue. And normally you don't start drafting yourself as a governor, this and somebody in the system is there paid to do that. He drafts it, it brings you to, if you're successful with it, go put it in the final thing and you sign. You correct and correct and correct. It's worse today. It's worse today. And there is something fundamentally wrong. We're talking of institutions, yes, but what are they producing? We are definitely not satisfied with the, the level. Definitely. We got some points sometimes back, I think some 10, 15 years ago. A guy does, uh, uh, he qualifies as a medical doctor. He goes to the UK to do a, a postgraduate program. No. To accept him. He has to do another one year. So something is wrong. It doesn't do with the curriculum. The curriculum is, is, is okay. Right. 
but the 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 the, 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 the teaching the discipline of the, say, of the student even on that uh, that this notion of uh, 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 separation of powers yes is there i'm a constitutional lawyer i read law and it was my llb my program my project was on uh, constitutional constitution law there is nowhere in the world as practicing democracy that there's absolute total separation of power it doesn't exist anywhere it doesn't exist and I st anybody who says it does, I challenge him on the program. He come here, we discuss it. Okay? Take, we are legislatures. I'm in the legislature. We make laws. Okay? The business of the judiciary is to interpret the laws made on this country. But in the course of interpretation, something will come at the top, top level, Supreme Court level. If they make, take a decision, the decision is final. And if that decision you know, corrects the notion you have about a particular law. That becomes the law that day. From that day, it becomes the law. Everywhere you go, that's what will be quoted. Okay? So to some extent, the judiciary does get involved in making law because they interpret laws. And that interpretation of the law becomes the real law. Okay? And you can't run away from this. So there is, there's nothing that is absolute. In terms of the yes, separation, yes, that's what it should be. There should be no interference on a daily basis as to what the executive is doing. We have as, law, as lawmakers, we have our oversight responsibilities. Uh, we do them, and where we find the executive wanting, yes, we stand up, we say it, and we yes. try to, so, to correct it. Yes, but Senator, you, 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 don't you think that Nigerians shouldn't worry at the level of uh, disagreements? And because it's nobody, a, nobody is saying I will be, I will be responsible. Yes, I don't. I do worry a lot. I do worry a lot, but I do want to. I do. I do want to worry positively. All right. I do want to worry positively. Like, why would a party that is in uh, is in government, uh, the governing party, can hardly get anything through in the legislature without a shutdown? Well, Cyril, Cyril, you and me know this. You know how this is Senate started, Eighth National Assembly. You know how it started. You know that was a big controversy in the election of the principal officers, starting with the president of the Senate. You know it, I know it's it. two years now. Let's hold, hold it, hold it, hold, hold it, hold it. What happened? There was some kind of RNG or arrangement between uh, a person who wanted to be Senate president going and reaching out to people who are not from his party and got a mandate. We saw it. We didn't like it. But for the, for, for, for to, to make this democracy succeed, to make the government take off without crisis, we accepted it. To date, as I talk to you, I recognize my president of the Senate. I respect his, uh, his, his views. But institutions, my quarrel any time with this th subject matter you have just brought, is we strengthen institutions not to serve a pub, one person. Not to pass just an interest. Institutions should be strengthened to serve the public interest. Where you strengthen the institution only because you want an individual who is a beneficiary in the institution to be there, then there's something wrong with it. And I, I never, never subscribe to that kind of stuff. So I agree with you that uh, we are supposed to be the Nigerians elected uh, uh, President Buhari and the Department of APC. They gave us a mandate. They gave us a mandate. Nigerians elected senators and members of representatives. And this party was lucky to have majority. But because of this that happened, the advantage of having majority has it's not been there all this while. And to the extent that people who are, who, who are supposed to be in opposition you know, are now virtually in some kind of de facto control of the, of the institution. So one might ask, um, well, let's say you are a senator. Um, where do you belong? Of course, the Senate. Where do you belong with what the people of Nigeria want their representatives to do in government? But again, as you talked about controversy, they say you are not, you are no stranger to controversy yourself. Yeah, that's why I'm not shaking. I'm not shaking. I'm doing what I'm doing. It's a very strong belief. Nigerians have a right to vote. They voted. They voted this government, APC government, under the leadership of uh, Mohamed Buhari as president. They voted for me and my colleagues to be in the National Assembly. All right, 
I believe that we have a duty, we have a trust with that vote that people gave us to be where we are. And we must respect that trust. Once you are not in tune with the trust, I mean with the trust that your platform has given you, something is wrong. And that's why we continue this snaky movement. I, I can be part of it. But then even among senators themselves, yes. uh, there are also issues as well. And I, re I, I refer to the uh, issue of uh, the Northern Senators Forum <laughs> and uh, brewing controversy. Well, it's, you see, uh, it's Siri, gone Siri, that. I don't want to go to the Northern Senators Forum thing. Mm. Okay. Uh, but you, you were in the thick of it. I, that one, I, was, I don't want to discuss that on television. Right. I don't want to discuss that. But perhaps, I, have, I, have, I have conscience. Perhaps what, okay, what I, want to, I can say this much. Right. I did not ask to be chairman. Okay. But Two, I was thought and believed to be a fit and proper person for that office. Right. It's not in the statutes. It's not in the, in the, in the um, what do you call it, this for the, for, the, for the National Assembly. And it is just a voluntary, informal okay. outfit. Okay? Uh, it's like you now, uh, in this responsibility uh, you are holding, uh, to have people in this place who are from, say, your state of origin and say, okay, look, why don't we, it's something that will promote our interests and we'll be advising home or do whatever. And you start a very informal thing. It's not to do with your employment in the NT, with the NTA. You can do that, all right. you know. And that is what the Northern Senators Forum and the Southern Senators Forum is all about. So I will see what we can do while we're there to promote our interests. Or something comes, an issue arises, and we'll take, take a look at what is the Northern interest here. Okay. and see how we can protect it, you know, in spite of the partisan thing. Sometimes we're bipartisan when, when it comes to power. So it's not an election by the Senate. Uh, I was privileged to, 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 to be honored to be to the chairman. After, as we talk today, I say so in my honor. There's no meeting of Northern Senators Forum that I was invited to that said to me, oh, you've done A, you've done B, you can't continue this. That's not like that. All right. So, so, so they say they've changed it. I accept it. Well, I'm, not, I'm not picking quite of anybody. Well, much as you might not want to talk about it, yes. would you just use the opportunity to clarify and set certain records straight? And that has to do with uh, all kinds of reports that have gone all around, particularly in the social media, that. quoting you to have said something about monkeys. Is that true? Quoting me, not me. I never, I never degenerate to that kind of level, right. because the guys who are trying to make a nonsense of this whole thing are the one making those kind of expressions, talking of monkeys, talking of rats, and what have you. In fact, one of them who said it was uh, a, a colleague of mine, the Sani. He was quoted Sani, Sheikh Sani. And when I met him, I said, "Which of these two are you then? Are you the rat, or are you a monkey?" Because when we went to Katsina for the retreat, another center for him, you took and signed 400,000 Naira, all right? And this is the money you're talking about. So are you a rat or are you a monkey? And he just went into laughter and he said nothing to date. Right. So, so, so I, like I said, I don't want to make this program, mm. you know, anything to serve my personal interest. I, I believe very strongly um, before I became uh, chairman of Northern Centers Forum, uh, nobody had heard about them for, for, for how long? Nobody did. And when I came on board, I tried to do the best I could and brought it back on the table. And uh, the fact that I'm able to do that, I thank those who th felt uh, I, I need, I, I'd be given that opportunity. Okay. I was given the opportunity. And um, everything has time. But then there's so, also so. A, a, another issue that's uh, all over now, particularly <laughs> now. And that's the attention that's been paid to how much legislators earn. Now with the disclosure of certain figures about what senators earn, which has been described as running costs. A lot of people have expressed outrage. Do you feel that uh, senators I, I, I think, that? I think, while anybody who believes the figure is too staggering, maybe justified to have his feeling, he has a right to his feeling, I can't question that. Hmm. But the fact of the matter, people tend to forget. We don't fix our salary. I didn't fix my salary. I didn't. There's an institution in this country called uh, Revenue Relations Fiscal Commission. They do it. And, and then, uh, who tell, okay, this is a letter I'm going to get. I say, oh, no, I don't want to take it. Well, the son who is saying it's been whatever, is free, he's conscious. How long has he been in the Senate? Has he not been taking the salary? Has he complained to anybody? So, so if, if it's a situation in which I fixed my salary and the senators fixed their salary, 
have somebody fix their salary, then the issue will arise. But you, you get elected. When I got elected, I was, nobody told me that this is what you, that's, your salary is going to be A. And I was attracted to that salary before I, I contested the election. I contested it because I desire to serve Nigeria okay. in the capacity of a legislator, a senator. And while I'm there, this is the salary that is payable to a senator. Or this is the allowance that is payable to a senator. I don't, it's not for me to go and say, no, All I'm right, not so going to take it. But well, for, we, we, let's, we, let's be honest with us on this. Okay, this might be fair also to us All on right, this. this might be hypothetical. Um, uh, but then, suppose you were not a senator today, yes. uh, senator, and you were just a farmer, even a successful, very successful farmer on your own right, yes. in your own right, yes. and you sat back and uh, looked at what legislators earn. Would you ask farmer Abdullahi yes. Adamu, yes. say to yourself, I think it's fair that they should earn this. I don't think it's fair. I think, again, uh, I said to you in the beginning of this question, answering your question, that every Nigerian has a right to okay. hold an opinion on this. Okay? And uh, to that extent, the hypothesis is too limited. All because right. I have answered in the beginning <laughs> that as a Nigerian, whether you are a farmer, you are a lawyer, or you are a trader, or a broadcaster like that you are, you have the right to your opinion on this. <laughs> but what's important is right. no senator fixes salary. Sure. No senator fixes allowances. This woman's just yes, right. Give and take. You've been on both sides. You were a governor, a two-term governor of Nasara State. So you've seen the executive, you've seen the legislature. You've, you've held a pointy position too. You were one I'm time minister. minister of state, yeah. uh, works and housing. Yeah. Which side would you be on that these... I think these are two worlds, right. each with its own kind of challenges. Mm. One, as a governor, the buck in the state stops on my table. Right. As a governor, whatever is happening in the state, as a chief executive officer of the state, I am held responsible for it. In the legislature, you are a lawmaker. And at best, sometimes, to go out, you know, overseeing what the executive is doing. And like I said, in the National Assembly or State Assembly, whichever assembly you go to, you are equal. The only thing that why they have a leader, the leader is, you know, is a leader among equals. It's number one among equals. And so you can never say that what you hold, the opinion you hold, because the back that doesn't stop on your, your, your seat, it doesn't stop there. Uh, you have a right to your, to your, to your opinion. And uh, while serving as a member, uh, when you are in session, you have a right to express your opinion over any issues that arises. There are procedures for doing this. And um, you do the best you can to contribute to any debate that is there. If you are going on oversight, you are not going to be alone. There are members of a committee. Some committees are as many as 20. And uh, if you are going for oversight, it's expected that all of you should go for oversight. That kind of stuff. So, so it's completely, the challenges are different. <clears throat> they are completely different. What do you think there's but, a general misunderstanding about the role of the various arms of government, especially in the public view? You think there's a, some misunderstanding? I, so, I, I believe very strongly that we need to come a little stronger on the side of the public. Okay. We need to always remember that we are elected. As they say, all politics is local. All right? Uh, I, have a, I have a constituency that elected me. I didn't get elected in the Senate. All right? I got elected to come to the Senate. Right. So whatever is in discourse, my mind reflects to my constituency. What will they ordinarily want? Even though, as a senator, the country becomes, if once you take over, the country becomes your constituency. But for heaven's sake, you come from somewhere. You have a mandate somewhere. And you should be able to have your ears to the ground as to what your constituents who voted for you to be where you are, you know, would like on a, given, on a particular uh, 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 issue that is in, in discussion. So, so uh, it's not enough just to come out to Abuja a um, little later and you start happening and happening. Uh, you go back, you have a constituency, you go back to it one day. And you say, oh, once I'm a senator, I'm in Abuja, I'm supposed to be a nationalist. Yeah, that doesn't take away the fact that if you're a nationalist, the fact that you to listen to your constituents doesn't take away the fact that you're a nationalist if you want to be one. But uh, some people like tell you to go and be a nationalist. Don't forget that. <laughs> well, all the squabbles, all the 
disagreements. On a final note, you think that um, this is the best system for this country? To be honest with you, there are times one can't help reflecting. Really. Uh, there are a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of factors that contribute to this. Sometimes we just take one of them. We have a problem as a country. And I say it with due respect to everybody, all our, our, our viewers. You see, we are a country that doesn't believe in solving its problem. Once you identify this is a problem on my way, that's on my way, that's on, on the way of Nigerians, when we come there, no, we don't, we don't take steps, solve it. No, we go around it. We try to go around it. Right. Try to go around it. All right? If we are faced with a problem, or we do a law, and it's in operation, we don't have the patience to see it blossom, to see it grow, to see it generate its own problems, and we rise to the problem and solve, and solve them. We don't do these things. We always want easy fixes. Easy fixes. We see the constitution that should determine what we do. It is the, 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 the grand norm we, we all took off to protect, to preserve. But often when these things happen, you know, either you want to change the order completely, uh, and then tomorrow another person comes, what you have done is no good, now he also wants to change it. So we keep just going, you know, uh, 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 rigmaroling. You know, and and that, that doesn't, doesn't solve the problem or desire of moving the country forward, unfortunately. Well, uh, it is on that point we'll have to leave this conversation. And uh, thank you very much. And do hope that uh, you'll come again some other time so, and uh, avail us of your wealth of knowledge in uh, these matters. Well, thank so, you very much. It's a pleasure, much, Thank Senator you so much. Thank Abdullahi you very much. Abdullahi Adamu, yeah. uh, King Kefi. Kefi yes. And of course, that's not the only one. You are also uh, Obateru of the... Are. Are. Obateru, Obateru of the sauce. Of the sauce. sauce. All right. That's what we leave here. Well, well, then if we want, we will land. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, thank, thank you very much for coming on one and one. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Zira. All right. 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 And uh, that's our program today. We thank you for watching. Next week, we'll be back with one and one. I am Cyril Stover. Bye for now.